So, as humans, it's said that we are made up, uh, that we are more than the sum of our parts, that we are shaped and defined by our experience and the memories that we create after the fact. Now, that's probably pretty obvious with the major events, the births, the deaths, the marriages, divorces. But what about the fleeting, the seemingly inconsequential moment that lodges itself within the shell of our unconscious, that single grain of life that once embedded proves to remain a touchstone, a transitional irritant that we play over and over again in our brains until they become the pearls that really enrich our lives. So in 1972, I entered uh, Mrs. Thompson's kindergarten class at Washington Elementary School and almost immediately made the acquaintance of two of my lifelong friends, Doug and Joey. <laughs> and uh, for the next 13 years, we were basically inseparable, did everything together. Now, Doug and I were these two super skinny white kids, uh, you know, pretty standard issue Oatana. Well, Joey was a little different in that he was a heavy set kid and he was Mexican in a very white town. But we didn't care. I mean, hell, we were five. All we cared about was all-star wrestling and evil Knievel. <laughs> now, Joey's family was made up of grandma, mom, dad, Joey, adopted brother, Harold, any number of foster kids, plus this large extended family across town. So two more kids at the table never seemed to matter. And Doug and I were always welcome, and we were always made to feel like family. Whether it was family reunions or the big Mexican dances they held at the St. Paul Civic Center. So one day, when we were about 12 years old, a bunch of us, the kids, we were out riding our bikes, and as 12-year-old boys are like to do, we started telling jokes, racist jokes, crude jokes. And I repeated a, a joke that relied upon a stupid stereotype about the Mexican people for its punchline. And we all started laughing. And then we realized that Joey had stopped his bike and he turned around and he started riding away. And I said, Joey, come on, stop! Come on, it's a joke! Come on! But he didn't stop, he kept riding. And I said, God, what a baby. So, seventh grade, I'm sitting in the back of Mr. Sternagel's math class, and I'm reading of Mice and Men, and I get to the part where George shoots Lenny in the back of the head, and I'm devastated. And I stand up, and I walk out of the room, and I have tears in my eyes, and Mr. Sternagel is going, Mr. Sweary! And he follows me out in the hallway where I apologize, and I explain, and he says, compose yourself, then come back into class. So once class is over, uh, I'm walking towards the door, and he says, Mr. Sweary, a word? I don't approve of you reading in math class. <laughs> However, I do approve of your reading material. If you like that, try this. And he gave me his copy of The Grapes of Wrath. And intentionally or not, that old mathematician made a junior socialist out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so, eighth grade, I'm walking through the school library, and I come across Action Now magazine. And it's got skateboarding, BMX, and surfing. But more importantly than that, it had Black Flag. It had an article about this California hardcore punk rock band. And that article just kicked me in the brain demanded that I find out more. More about Black Flag and DOA and Bad Brains and Minor Threat and the Dead Kennedys. All of these underground bands that you really had to work to find. <coughs> these bands that were trying to make music that mattered. And here were these angry kids who were writing songs about politics and racism and sexism and corporate greed. You know, the popular radio was playing I Can't Drive 55. Well, the men were writing songs about the Iran-Contra scam. Uh, you know, Footloose was really popular. Well, at the same time, Joe Biafra was writing songs about the stars and stripes of corruption and Reagan's war on the poor. It was loud and angry, but it had a social conscience, and it demanded that you question everything. And if you don't like the answer, change it. If you see an injustice, work to change it. And that music did as much to shape my life as four years of college. So, 2011, and it's the night of our 25-year class reunion, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're sitting in Doug's backyard around a bonfire, and I turn to Joey, and I say, Hey, man, do you remember when we were kids that day I told that racist joke and you took off? I'm sorry. 
I never apologized, and I feel bad about that. I'm sorry. And he looked at me and he said, Pinch your widow, you see what you get for messing with the Mexican people? 30 years of guilt. <laughs> and then he said, Honestly, ma'am, I don't remember it, but I'm glad that you do. So there you go. Three seemingly trivial events that went on to shape the rest of my life. And as I stand here, the product of those and a million other moments, a middle-aged white guy working in county government looking to improve our culture of diversity and inclusion, a field that can feel absolutely glacial in terms of progress now and then. And I urge you to go back and look at your own lives for these trivial moments. But why? Why are they important? Because I feel that they stand as a reminder that often our true work is done at a micro level, on the individual level, within ourselves and in the fleeting interactions as we pass each other on the street, as we complete small transactions across the counter. See, when we start to see that even our most trivial of interactions can have life-changing implications, then we can cease to see diversity and inclusion as a series of broad policy implementations and start to see it as an endless series of opportunities to touch, enrich, and change each other's lives. That's interesting. Thank you.